Hello, listeners, and welcome to the lockdown series of the British Academy of Jewelry podcast. I'm Sophie Boons, and today I've invited another experienced guest to join me in a remote discussion on what the future of jewelry and retail may hold, particularly in response to the prospect of jewelry shops reopening soon. For jewelry retailers across the globe, the coronavirus pandemic has caused disruption very few of us would have been prepared for. Now that regulations to protect us all when shopping have been released, the public-facing side of the trade can be kick-started again. To discuss the challenges we face and more, I have invited Director of Pressman Mastermelt and Chairman of the Hatton Garden Bid, Gary Williams. Gary, welcome. Oh, thank you very much. Hello. Gary, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? I've spent most of my life in the jewellery trade. And these days, I'm a general manager, really, of Pressman Master Melts. And Pressman Master Melts is a reclamation and recycling company. I look after anything to do with jewellery because my experience is manufacturing, also retailing, uh, various retail um, experiences over the years. We work with the workshops, we work with the retailers for scrap, we do workshop waste, we, we do educational seminars. Uh, there's so many things that, that we do as a business. And during the lockdown, because a lot of the things that we also do are industrial reclamation across the, across the globe, really, and the pharmaceutical companies have still been sending us material for processing because of the drug industry has been really busy. Um, so we've been processing their precious metals, which they use in, in uh, their processing systems and things. So, uh, yeah, so that's what I do now. You know, it's been a really interesting career. I've spent, you know, all my life really in the jewellery trade. So for the last 45 years, I like to think I just try to make a difference. That, that's that's what I you know I focus on. I do the job, but I try to make a difference within the trade. Can you tell us what made you decide to join the jewelry trade? Okay, actually, when I was at school, my brother-in-law was a diamond setter, and he arranged for me to do a diamond setting apprenticeship. Uh, and I took my GCSEs, and then I was doing A levels, and I was leaving to do a five-year apprenticeship, and. I knew that I could not sit in one place for five years. So in the end, I decided that that wasn't for me and, and we were doing something else. But he always had some money on him and he was always taking my sister out. So uh, I had lots of jobs, including in the jewellery trade, uh, a job with a costume jewellery company where I was a rep and I loved it. Um, and I was about to get married and I was between jobs, which in those days wasn't really a big problem. And my future mother-in-law said, don't you think you better settle down and get a job? You need a mortgage. You've got to look after my daughter and you know, plan for the future. And it made me sit down and think. And I thought, you know, what do I like doing and what do I want to do? And after very short space of time I thought I really liked being a jewellery salesman even though it was mainly costume jewellery and a bit of silver I really liked it um I get a company car nobody's looking over my shoulder you know and I was in my um I was in my early 20s and uh, I applied for quite a few jobs in the jewellery industry and I was really lucky because most people didn't want to entertain me because Really, I had no experience and no customer area to call on. Uh, and I eventually secured a, an interview with Eddie Brown of Brown and North. And we got on brilliantly, absolutely brilliantly. And, and I started the following week. In fact, the interview talked about everything except the job. And at the end, he said to me, uh, well, do you want the job? And I said, well, exactly what is it? And how much does it pay? Uh, do I get a car? And, uh, and I started the following week and, you know, basically I became a, a, a sales director of Brown and after a couple of years and, and uh, we built that company up from a very small company to a major award-winning multi-million pound business 
uh, and I enjoyed every minute of it over the 30 odd years that I was there until we sold the business. That's an incredible story. Do you say that this is still true today, that when you start out in, in this industry, which is different than other industries, that it's important to make a network of people because that's how you might navigate in this industry? Uh, it's not important, it's crucial. And uh, when you're young, you don't realise that. But even today, although a lot of the people that were my contemporaries have either retired or, or you know, moved on in other ways. Um, yeah, and I noticed that all through those years, all those people I met, and I met some amazing people, and I'm still meeting amazing people now, designer makers, you know, different generation, doing absolutely fantastic things. And, and, and you try to sort of help them develop what they're doing so that they can actually make some money at it. But it's knowing all of those people. And, and a lot of people come to me because I know a lot of people. And there's always somebody that can help somewhere along the line. Um, and that's very true at the moment with the beard in Hatton Garden and, and the problems that, that the jewellers are having here. But yes, you know, you get to know a lot of people and I would say, my wife really doesn't uh, understand that some of my friends from the jewellery industry have been friends with me for 40 years and she's never met them, you know, but they are, they are, they are good friends within the industry and they're all different levels of positioning. Everybody will help you. So you just need to have people to ask. It's quite rare. This doesn't happen in a lot of other industries. Uh, no, I don't, I don't believe it does. But, uh, you know, I, I look on the, the social network platforms and, and constantly I see jewellers saying, I'm making this, who can tell me how to do that? Or I need a bit of machinery, where would I go to do this? How does it work? And the, the networking of advice is just incredible in this industry. As mentioned, you are the chair of the Hatton Garden Business Improvement District. For those listening who do not know what the Hatton Garden bit does, could you tell us a little bit more about it and how anyone could engage or stay up to date on its efforts? Okay, really quickly, I saw that the Crossrail was coming to Farringdon and the conversations I had with people in the property uh, business were explaining to me that once, once that opens, you know, property prices are going to go through the roof, um, landlords will redevelop their buildings, and there was already this indication that there was pressure in the area on the jewellery industry. You know, they want, landlords want office people, they, they don't want jewellers, jewellers uh, require too much and they need extraction and they need security and they're yeah, gas and they, they may be a bit noisy or you know so I could see there was a problem and uh, I knew from the other bids that around London that were going on that eventually there'd be a bid in Hatton Garden area and it would probably be run by landlords and property people and the jewellery trade would be uh, pushed out so with some of my connections at the time we got together and Basically, we proposed our own bid. You've got to understand that the bid is there to support all the businesses within a footprint, not just the jewellery trade. But as a jeweller, being the chairman, and uh, it meant that the jewellery trade would always have a good voice at the table. And, you know, I could support them uh, in some of the things that were going on. So... That's basically what I do. That's what the bid does. It's there to help and support businesses. We're promoting the area. We're looking after retail. We're looking after the digital companies. I tend to feel that if I hadn't have done this at the time, the focus of Hatton Garden as a jewellery historic quarter would have been swept away and lost. So I am one of those guys, you know, I'm a bit like Don Quixote. I'm tilting at windmills and I'm fighting the fight on behalf of the jewellery trade. Sometimes I win a few and sometimes I lose a few, but 
at least we've got a chance. And you have to remember that a lot of the jewelers are small businesses who actually, what happens with the, the, the bid is it's a government agreement. Once people vote for it, the businesses vote for it, they have to pay a percentage of their business rates into the fund. They can't choose not to, it goes in. So we set the bar of, of the business rates reasonably high, which meant that, one, we don't have to deal with a lot of companies in voting, which is a way of getting it through quicker. And two, the jewellery trade in the main was excluded because they, their businesses were below the business rates. So some of the arguments I get uh, around the, my board, which is a very mixed board, is that we spend... 95% worrying about the jewellery trade, 95% of the time, and the jewellery trade represents 16% of our income. So, you know, I have to juggle those things to, to get the results. But, you know, we're here to support, you know, we support the area, but for me, I'm here to support the trade. And would you not say that 95% of the history of the area is jewellery? So it is fair enough. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's very true. And, and it's world renowned. And even with, with the heist a couple of years ago, I mean, it's terrible, but the publicity around the world was amazing. And if you talk to somebody all over the world about Hassan Garden, they know it's a jewellery area. But unfortunately, some of the businesses... You know, they, they think that's old fashioned and, you know, we should be a much more eclectic area, much more fun and the jewellery shouldn't be the focus. And that as chairman, I can keep moving that back and saying, yeah, I understand that. But, you know, we are, that's what's special about our area. Otherwise, we're just another area. So that's my job. Pressman Mastermelt have been particularly active during the lockdown. I myself have had a go at one of those fantastic quizzes you have been publishing on social media. It was actually quite hard. <laughs> what was the strategy behind these engaging posts? And would you have any advice for businesses to up their game with their digital presence? Uh, yeah, I can tell you. Right. What we do, we're very proactive. We go out and we do educational, you know, at the beginning of the year, we were in Edinburgh with a load of uh, jewellers in, in Scotland, teaching them about reclamation. Uh, we love it. We love engaging with, with our customers and our and prospective future customers. And what I started to do, we, we put out a beware newsletter for Pressman's. Pressman's is, a, is the oldest trade scrap counter in London. And, you know, we get a lot of goods sent to us, which are fake. The jewellers have bought them and they paid for them. And when they arrive, we test them because we test everything and, and we find that they're not real. And, or they're, they're stamped 18 carat and really they're plated. Or, you know, people don't still don't, don't understand, but they don't understand. So we had a, 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 an information booklet called Beware, which is on our website, where you can look at the most common fakes that are in the area. But what we decided to do was go one stage further. It's about adding value. So we started to do a weekly newsletter to all of the jewellers with what we bought that week that wasn't, wasn't what it was supposed to be. And the jewellers loved it. The pawnbrokers loved it. The retailers loved it. I mean, if we get a stainless steel chain that's got a stamp on it telling me it's platinum, the chances are somebody in a jeweler shop bought that in an area and there might be more. So they were really interested. Now, when we obviously went into lockdown, it was a problem because we weren't buying any more scrap because the, you know, the shop was closed. So we decided that we didn't want to lose that customer engagement. What could we do to keep that going and add value? So. For Pressman's, we sat down and we wrote a number of quizzes. Some were easier than others. Some were more, more trade and some were more fun. But, you know, we started with hallmarking. So it, it was a bit of education. You'd get some right, some things you'd learn that you didn't know. And the response from the first quiz was phenomenal. So we, that's what we've been doing. Each week, we came up with another quiz you know, first of all, it was hallmarking, and then it was 
pawnbroking, and then it was stones, and bit by bit by bit, it's a cross section of different things to do with the jewellery industry, and even even the phone quizzes, which uh, I had great pleasure in writing. I think it's called the Gold Quiz, but it was it was all about music and films, anything that had a gold in the title. And uh, so, you know, and people liked it, it was fun. I think after a while they got quizzed out because the whole world is zooming on quizzes. So, but then luckily things are changing and now we're telling people about Pressman's free post, we're opening the shop again, you know, those things. So we're still giving them information and we're still engaging with them. But we've been really, really, really active. When you ask me about what can the jewellers do, I, I, I look on social media, but you know, I'm a dinosaur, but, and I still, I still manage to post a few things here or there. It's obvious to me that Instagram is the thing to be. You know, that's, that's the platform to be. The jewellers, if they want to engage with the audience that's now, the people that are spending money, the young married, it's Instagram. They're looking on there. The amount of jewellery pictures, the amount of fun information that's engaged on Instagram, I think is, is phenomenal, right? You know, the older people like me are still Facebook based, right? But that's not where you need to engage. I don't believe in the jewellery trade anymore. The Facebook is a bit flat and people like me just flick through because we're bored. We're not looking to buy anything. We're not looking, you know, we're not doing research. Um, whereas on Instagram, it's alive. Retailers and jewellers makers and designers, you know, they need to be engaging with that audience because that's where the commissions are going to come from. That's where they can promote their, their bricks and mortar shops with unusual products. And some of the stuff I see on there, it's just brilliant absolutely brilliant I, I love it i really do so my advice is if you're not if you, look first of all you've got to sort your website out because you don't want people to come to your website and it's a drag boring unadventurous you know the website if you haven't sorted that out you're really behind the curve here and, and you are losing your place in the market your website's got to be great if you've got a shop it's got to be great. It's got to be better than it's ever before. The experience of dragging people from Instagram into your shop has got to be special. It's no good just being a high street jewellers now that sells a bit of stuff and the things in the window are boring. But that side of the jewellery trade is declining and is finished. And start with social media and move into bricks and mortar if you've got it, but the whole experience has got to be special. People don't want ordinary anymore. You can see ordinary around the corner everywhere, right? Yes. So I guess if, if they're gonna make the trip, particularly in the climate of today, if you're gonna transport yourself somewhere, then you'll want an experience that is worth it. Yeah, I think that's the thing. We deal with a lot of retailers and, because I was a manufacturer for 30 years, I know a lot of retailers. And I look at the ones that are still successful and they're the ones that are changing all the time, pushing all the time. And the, you know, the bigger ones can afford to do it. The smaller ones, it's more of a push. But I know very small, like one and two man retail businesses that are doing incredibly well from their postings. You know, they're getting people that want to come and see their shop because it's not padded out, it's not an ordinary jewellers, you know, it's, it's quirky, it's interesting. And, you know, there are a lot of shops like that. So whether you're a big shop doing big brands and have a, you know, a loyal following or you're a small shop, there's room for everybody. But the thinking's got to be the same. It can't be ordinary. Some jewellery brands you mentioned, small, big, will find it easy to adapt also to the new regulations that we're all having to apply with. Others might find it more challenging. What advice would you have for anyone currently preparing for these next steps and where to go if they're not so sure? <laughs> um, right, well, if we're talking about COVID uh, and how you, how you need to do that, if you've not already done it, you're, you've really got a problem. 
because you've had 10 and a half weeks to really get yourself sorted out. So if you haven't at least placed your orders and started receiving your signs for the carpet and your wall signs and your anti-back cleaner and your gloves and all those things, which are, have been quite difficult to get at some stage. If you haven't been planning that, then there's something wrong with your business. It's all available. Everything is available. It's expensive. I mean, you know, a, a small anti-back, personal anti-back, which was 90p is now £4.50. Um, but if you want customers to come in your shop, you've got to have it planned. You've got to, I mean, we've been marking out the floors here for two metres. We've been putting the floor stickers, keep your social distance. We've got signs up about washing your hands. I've got automatic um, anti-back dispensers in strategic places. You know, we've had to wait for all these things to come in, but we knew that at some stage people were going to come back and we had to make them feel comfortable. Right? And um, you, know, you need a very clear plan of what you need to do. You know, we, we've spent the last few weeks writing our policies, which are required. We've been doing our risk assessments, which are required. We've written policy documents for the staff to understand what we've done as a company, what we expect them to do as employees in the building, how we're going to interact with people that come in the building. You know, we've laid everything down. There, there's a movement policy for walking around the building. There's a cleaning, there's a personal hygiene policy. There, you know, we've got policy. Look, nobody wants to do these things, but they've got to be done. And if you haven't started, you better get on with it. Otherwise, you know, if your shop's opening next week and you're not ready to make people feel comfortable and your shop isn't going to be an exciting adventure that makes it worth someone risking coming to see you, then, you know, you're going to get left behind. Would you also say, like, of course, supermarkets adapted really quickly because they intended to stay open, but it's not right to compare a jewelry retail experience with a supermarket experience. So there is an added layer, not just the safety that needs to be ticked, but the safety cannot be so prevalent that the experience is no longer positive. Yeah, no, 100%. The, um, that's, that's why I say the experience. If they're going to come out to your shop and they're going to take the risks and they're going to, they, because they, they definitely are making a journey to see you. Now, when they come, they've got, they've got to feel that it's amazing. They've got to be trapped really well. The fact that they have to stand two metres apart or whatever, if you've planned your shop properly, it's not going to be an issue because it will be natural. If when they come in, you go, no, 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 move back. No, you can't stand there. And, you know, then, then again, you know, you're going to uh, stop people coming to you and enjoying being there. And they're not going to spend any money with you. Right? Got to feel that they are the most special thing to you as they're a customer and you really appreciate their business. And not just that, you know, these are your future friends because these are people that you're going to see more than once. So look after them. You know, I always say to people that it's really strange. When you're dealing with customers, the wrong way of dealing with customers is very easy. It really is, you know. You know and I always say to people, if your friend came to your door and knocked on the door, what would you say to them? You'd say, Oh, really nice to see you. Come on in, sit down, let me get you a drink. You know, you, you, it would be really natural and it would be really friendly and it would be a pleasure. But so many businesses don't do that with customers. Customers walk in, they're ignored, they wander around the shop, they're ignored, or it's, can I help you? Can I help you? I think, you know, I think, you know we're still using that. And then they go, no, I'm just looking. Right? It's fantastic. Can I help you? No, I'm just looking. And then they wander around the shop and they wander out. You know, there's no engagement, there's no story, there's no interest. And if you're running a business like that, actually you won't survive. You may have survived up to now, but you won't survive moving forward. Because people want a lot more than that. They expect a lot more.
Yeah, that makes sense to me. When businesses start to experience what works and what doesn't, do you think it would be worth sharing these diverse experiences with each other in the industry? And how do you think this is currently done? And how could it be improved that it's being done? Uh, sharing is an interesting thing because we, you know, we touched on it before, and there is a lot of shared information going on at the moment. People don't share how they deal with customers, and they generally share when customers complain about something, and, and how, how would somebody else deal with it? And you know, it's, do I think it's fair that I charge for this repair? Does everyone in the industry think it's fair that I charge for this repair? or shortening the watch bracelet and the customer was upset, I charged them, you know, all those things. We do need to share. We do need to learn from other people's experiences. For me, I, I think at the moment, the shining example of that is, is the CMJ, the Company Master Jewelers, which is a buying group. It's got retailers and it's got suppliers. And, you know, they, they've had their, their troubles and they're, and they're coming through them various issues I've had to deal with. But uh, what I see now is more sharing of information between retailer and retailer. Uh, there's a lot of that. They go and do retailer visits to see how other people run their stores. They're very open and they've learned a lot about the way other people are doing things more successfully and they realize what goes wrong. They've also now started with the suppliers talking to each other there's a suppliers forum where suppliers are now sharing you know through whatsapp and, and various other things they're sharing their issues with dealing how are they going to deal with retailers how are they going to call on retailers how are companies showing their product you know, all these different things um, and they're sharing and then there's a coming together where they do a joint thing for the retail and the suppliers. And I see that working and I see, I see the responses from people and the comments they make and how important it's become to do that. Now, I don't know how many retailers are in the CMJ, you know, maybe 120 and there may be 250 shops. Okay, there's quite a lot of suppliers. There might be another 100 suppliers. Right? Although we think it's big, it's only a small part of the industry. But I see that sharing as, as being the sort of bedrock of us moving forward and understanding how to work together much better. You know, we need to learn from each other if we're going to survive. And, you know, they're doing it. And the NAJ, you know, as far as the National Association of Jewelers, they're also, they're trying very hard to establish themselves as, you know, the go-to source for information for sharing you know and so we're lucky in the jewelry trade we do have go-to areas where we can find things out and learn things and as we said at the beginning you know we like to share we don't we're not a secretive organization we share our successes yeah i think that's really good i mean i went to a virtual reality and augmented reality conference the idea of augmented reality and virtual reality in retail seems to be really explored, applied in a lot of industries, but not as much in jewelry. What's your thoughts on this? About, oh, I don't know, quite a few years ago, maybe five or six years ago, there was a company, I think it was called Holition, and they're still going today. And um, they were giving away plastic pieces of jewelry where you could go onto the website and try and put, put your plastic ring on and try a sapphire and diamond ring and, and different things. And I thought, it was, I thought it was really brilliant. And I'm amazed that we haven't seen more of it over the five years. But yesterday, I was flicking through my social media platforms and I saw somebody advertising which looked like a, a beautiful fan ring encrusted with stones but it was augmented reality as they were moving their hand the the plastic base or or the base ring was coming through but you know i thought to myself wow we're gonna we're getting there we're starting to do that you know you, 
you do that in every other industry, as you say. I watch the the uh, housing program where the two architects go in and they, they put, put on the mask and, and you, you walk into the house as it is and then the walls all disappear and everything. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. And I watch it for that more than the design because the reaction from, from the, the house owners is, is, is just amazing that one minute they're in what they think is their own house and the next minute the walls are disappearing, the things are coming up from the floor and they've got a completely different area. You know, we use it, we use it in fashion, we use it in, in all sorts of other areas. But the jewellery trade has always been a bit slow in innovation. We dabble, but I think the problem is that mainstream jewellery doesn't make the money that people think we make. I, and I've always understood that. They think because you're dealing in gold and because you're dealing in diamonds, you know, everybody's a multimillionaire and, you know, we give a, we give a false impression because we're really workers who happen to work in precious items. And investment in technology, and I know as a, as a company director for 30 years, the reason we became one of the top manufacturers in the country was because I put a budget aside every year for a large investment. So we were one of the first people to do CAD. We were one of the first people to do machine, automated machine cutting. You know, we were always looking at the next thing. Um, and sometimes we spend a lot of money and it took years and we get nowhere. But a lot of times it was the right thing to do. But when we talked to other companies, they didn't have the money to, to invest in those technologies unless they could guarantee the return. And at the beginning, you can't. So the jewelry trade is quite slow in innovation. I mean, we're still... You know, by now, every workshop should have a printer, you know, um, a, a CAD printer. You know, everyone should be have the CAD, have the sample, have the, you know, print to wax. You know, if, if they're not even do, doing their own casting, it should, we should have that. And they're not. And, and it's amazing, I went to workshops, they don't even have laser welders. You know, they're still soldering. You know, and it's about money. You know, a small jeweller is, is doing the best he can to make a living and, and buy the things he needs and pay for his family and all the rest of it. So the successful people are the ones that invest in innovation because if you, wa if you watch um, some of the how How's It Done programs on telly, um, everything is automated, absolutely everything. So people have spent millions of pounds automating their factories and had two or three people and everything, you know, Heinz, this week I, I, I flicked through and, and can't remember who it was, but somebody was visiting the Heinz factory and they're talking about millions of cans of beans a week and everything is done by machine. The cooking, the, the, the labelling, the canning, the, the quality control. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're a cottage industry that gets bigger from time to time. So, you know, at the moment we're back in a cottage industry when I came in, we were a cottage industry, small businesses. Then there was the rise of the companies, and I was one of them. And we had, I don't know, maybe a dozen or 20 big companies. Well, most of those have gone. And now we're back to lots of small businesses. All the people that worked in the big companies came away for, as those companies stopped trading and set up their own small companies. So I look at the jewellery industry today, and I find it very um, as I say, cottage industry, small companies, very design-based quality work, what we should be known for. I mean, it's, I think, what will set us apart. I think it's something we should celebrate, but the idea of those innovations and maybe some companies trying things out or collectively investing in certain things to try and see what works and what doesn't, I think is still something we should try and look for to inspire more of because augmented reality, and particularly in times of today where it's not so nice to think about touching stuff, before you try something and before you go and invest in it and buy it, maybe trying it at home 
just seeing whether you like it is an interesting concept. I think, I think you made a, a really good point. You know, we talk about sharing information and we do, and we're really good. What we don't do is we don't collaborate. And, and I can go back many years where I tried to collaborate. I mean, platinum is a standard bridal theme. Now, in the early 80s, it, it, it came in, it was really big for a few years, and then it disappeared. And, and in the, in the mid-90s, I started to produce platinum wedding rings. And I went to an engagement ring company and said, look, actually, I'm selling some platinum wedding rings you know, usually as replacements or whatever, but I'm, I'm actually selling them. There is interest. I sell a lot more platinum wedding rings if you sold platinum engagement rings because every platinum engagement ring you sell, somebody's going to want a platinum wedding ring. And I went to about four diamond ring manufacturers who were not interested until I found one who we did a joint collection of only about 12 pieces and we went out and their rep sold it and I, my rep sold it. And we had an agreement that my customers were my customers, their customers were their customers, the, the reps would get commission. We wouldn't be trying to take the, you know, if I wasn't taking their engagement rings and they weren't taking my wedding. It's a very hard thing to do. But the collaboration was the beginning of the rise of platinum bridal and with innovation like um, like we're talking about here augmented reality it's expensive and two or three companies getting together and doing it as a joint venture they still use it in their own ways or maybe setting up their own hub which all that with three companies or two companies use you know, there are ways of doing it, and that's the way we should move forward, definitely. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Some of the audience listening obviously might be really stressed about what's going on. This is not an easy time. As an experienced member of the trade, do you have any advice on how to keep positive and where to turn for support if you're really, you know, you need someone to talk to or you're not sure whether your business is going to be viable and it's worth investing in these changes as well. Okay. Um, I, I, I think that while we've been uh, in lockdown, I've been totally impressed with the amount of support online that has been going. I've attended a few webinars myself, okay, and the learning the information that's been passed on through webinars and, and it's just sitting there watching somebody, you know, explain some things for, for 15, 20 minutes, then you can ask some questions. If you haven't been engaging with webinars, you've still got some time to do it. And the interesting thing is the people that have been giving the webinars have been doing it free and have been dealing with inquiries from businesses. I mean, you know, um, most people may have heard of Helen Dimmitt. Um, you know, she's been doing a lot of webinars and passing on a lot of information and people have been asking her advice. She's, she's been a retailer, she's a consultant. She, you know, she, she right the, the whole spectrum. I, I sat in on um, Kerry Gregory, Gemology Rocks. Uh, Kerry is, is an incredible bundle of energy and all she wants to do is teach people about coloured stones. There are people here ready to support you. And, and people like me, you know, people come to me, the, the jewellers here for lots of reasons, have lots of issues, landlord issues, rent issues, Camden issues. I spend my time, whatever time I can give, uh, to trying to solve those problems. The, we go back to the NAJ. The NAJ have been doing webinars and information. You know, there's a lot of things out there for people to access if they look, right? You know, if you've got a problem, somebody out there can solve it for you. And all you've got to do is look. Sending a message on instant message or WhatsApp or, or an email takes a second these days and somebody will come back and help you out. I mean, you know, they, they, 
that's on the business side. On the, on the financial side, you know, I've been blown away by the support financially that the charities have been giving to the jewellery trade. You've got the goldsmiths who have given, you know, 700,000, the thick end of a million pounds to jewellery people who have found themselves in, in really difficult positions. You know, that's not to go and buy a new scanner, but that's to get them out of, you know, real problems with financial difficulties. I know the uh, Jewellers and Silversmiths charity, you know, they too have been approached by people who really can't survive. You know, they've got medical problems or financial problems that more so than just, you know, I could do with some money to pay my staff. You know, we're talking about people that are in desperate situations and need support. So you've got goldsmiths, you've got the Jewellers and Silversmiths charity, you've got the Benevolent Fund in Birmingham for the British Allied Trade Federation, which is the NAJ's parent company. And I know from, from the conversations I've had there, they've been supporting people. So the people that really need it, there are places to go to help you. They won't uh, they won't pay for your business. You know, your business will survive or fall on what you do. But on a personal basis, yeah, I really want to sort of give a shout out or, or wave the flag for, for the work that the charities do, which people just don't know about. Mm, yeah, it's absolutely true. You have been in lockdown also. Can you tell us what you have been working on to keep busy? I mean, we know that you've been very busy, but what have you done in order to face this challenge with a smile and, and positivity? Um, okay, well, I, as you say, I've been incredibly busy throughout the whole time. Um, part of that is engaging with all my staff who, you know, some of them have been working from home. Some of them have been really good and coming in and helping, you know, with a just a handful of people in the building or, you know, sometimes just two people in the building. So I've been engaging with the staff a lot, making sure they're all okay, keeping them up to date, letting them know that they're, they don't have to worry about their jobs and things like that. We've been working on the policies, you know, all the COVID, the building has to be COVID safe. We put personal packs together of PPE for every member of staff. You know, it's all taken time to get together. But one of the interesting things is it made me realise that as a company, we handle and print forest loads of paper in, in everything we do. And I've looked at the company and because of the COVID and because of the touching and because of the people coming in and all those things, it actually, it, it's made us realise that we should be working towards getting rid of paper, if not completely, but, you know, as much as we can, save on paper, save on ink, save on plastic folders and all those things and, and become a, a more paperless office. The systems need to be uh, strengthened, you know, so that they can accommodate with a lot of things that we print. It needs to be in the systems. Some of our machinery needs to be talking to our computer systems and things like that. But as a project, you know, it's, it's something that's come out of the, the terrible situation that we're in. You know, we're an environmentally friendly business because although we reclaim and recycle, we have to be environment for our permits. You know, we're always way ahead of what our permits say we can do um, because we know that things change. So we try and be ahead. So environmentally, we're very conscious of what we do. And when you look around the building and you think, well, why have we got all this paper? We're an environmentally conscious business. So for us, that's been something that's come out of the COVID, you know, situation, which will make a massive change to us as a business and has given us something to work on while we've been in lockdown. Wherever you are, and, and whether you're a retailer, whether you're a designer maker, whether you're a setter, a mounter, a polisher, right? In your business, stop, take a deep breath and say, what's next? Because something is around the corner. 
right? And either you're going to drive it or it's going to hit you on the head. So what's next? That's the question. And that's how, that's how we learn. Yeah, I think that is brilliant advice. As a business, it's never perfect. Nothing is ever perfect in life anyway. So it's trying to think no. about, okay, what's the next step towards that ideal? And tomorrow that ideal will be something else. So you will always be improving. Absolutely. Everything, everything changes, right? And as much as you plan, you have to be flexible. And so you've always got to be looking at what's ahead, what can you do that can improve? What do you do next? Don't be, my, my only advice to everybody in this industry is please don't be complacent because you'll get left behind and you won't survive. Brilliant. Thanks so much. As we emerge from lockdown, the challenge is not over, but week after week, I'm convinced the road ahead might pose challenges, but none that cannot be overcome. There are institutions part of our trade that are there to look after its prosperity and the possibility for innovation is endless. For now, I would like to say thank you to Gary Williams. We are very grateful for your insights and time. Thank you, Gary. It was a pleasure. Next week, I'll be joined by another guest. So watch this space to find out who it is. For now, this was Sophie Boons for the lockdown series of the BAJ podcast titled The Next Step for Retail with Gary Williams. Thank you for listening and have a wonderful weekend.